What dark and enigmatic fate awaited the young couple on what was supposed to be a romantic getaway from the daily pressures of life? J. Roland Cook, 20 years old, and Tanya Van Kylenborg, 18 years old, embarked on a journey from their Canadian hometown of Saanich, British Columbia, to Seattle, Washington, on November 18, 1987. However, as they traveled, something sinister occurred, and they vanished without a trace. Their destination was never reached, and their disappearance remained a baffling enigma for over three decades, cloaked in obscurity and concealed secrets. For more than thirty years, the truth behind their vanishing remained elusive. What dreadful events unfolded during their trip? What hidden horrors and deceitful webs of lies were woven, carefully guarded for so many years, until the moment the truth was ultimately uncovered? The mystery surrounding the young couple's disappearance beckons us to delve into the depths of darkness to unearth the long-concealed answers. Hi and welcome back to our channel. If you are new here, please consider subscribing as it helps us motivate to create more intriguing content for you. Let's have a look at the 1987 twisted cold cases solved after 31 years by a hint. Skagit County, Washington, indeed stands as a hidden gem within the breathtaking landscape of the Pacific Northwest. Nestled between the majestic Cascade Mountains to the east and the glistening waters of Puget Sound to the west, it boasts a stunning and diverse natural beauty that captivates all who set foot within its boundaries. The residents of Skagit County are known for their warm hospitality, friendliness, and a strong sense of community. With a genuine appreciation for their connections to one another and their deep-rooted attachment to the land, they have cultivated a thriving and closely knit society. Traveling through Skagit County, one can traverse a tapestry of experiences. Quiet and charming villages evoke a sense of tranquility and timelessness, harking back to simpler days of the past. Old towns exude a sense of nostalgia, with their historical architecture and captivating stories etched into every brick and cobblestone. Skagit County is a place where both serenity and excitement coexist harmoniously. But a dark story once happened in the middle of the scenery. Here, the bodies of young lovers Jay and Tanya were found. Their deaths broke the peace and quiet of this beautiful place. People from her past called her sweetie, and she was full of life and energy. Tanya Van Kylenborg was born on March 7, 1969, in Victoria, British Columbia. She loved playing basketball and was a talented player on the senior girls team at Oak Bay High School. Tanya had a strong personality and was determined to become a photographer after finishing high school. She wanted to move away from her hometown to pursue her dreams. Tanya's family enjoyed going on boat trips around the Salish Sea, and she and her brother, John Van Kallenborg, often played tennis on their one-acre land. Tanya had a compassionate heart for animals and loved taking care of them, from gerbils to cats. She had long wished for a dog and finally convinced her mother to get one. Tessa, a loyal golden retriever, became Tanya's beloved companion. Tanya's dream was to work with animals, and she even considered becoming a veterinarian. She was still figuring out her path in life, and her top priority was saving money to visit her father's family in Holland. Tanya's journey of discovering her passions and aspirations had just begun, and she was excited about the possibilities that lay ahead. Tanya and Jay met when they were both in high school at Oak Bay High. Friends who knew both of them put them in touch, and they began dating in the spring of 1987. Jay Roland Cook was born to Gordon and Leona Cook on December 16, 1966, in Victoria, Canada. With his friendly smile and love of a good joke, Jay always had a lot of friends around him. He liked a lot of things, and playing bass guitar with his friends back in his hometown on Vancouver Island was one of them. He wanted to be a marine scientist, so he worked at a pizza place for a while. One night, after his shift, he rode his bike for three hours in the rain and darkness to bring pizza to his friends who were staying in a cabin for the weekend. Jay had a good heart. He would take his younger sister, Laura, out to dinner 
and once even bought her high tea with the money he made on a fishing boat. Everyone who knew him said he was sweet. Even though the young couple was polite and did not get into fights, something bad was waiting for them on the day they went missing. Jay had not eaten anything on the cool morning of November 18, 1987. He was about to pick up his girlfriend Tanya and take an exciting overnight trip from British Columbia to Seattle, Washington, in Jay's father's bronze 1977 Ford Club van. He asked his sister Laura for the sandwich she was eating, and she gave it to him hesitantly. Before he left the house, he said goodbye to her. Jay's dad Gordon was in business with Spud Talbot, and they needed furnace parts worth $750 from Jensko Heating in Seattle. So when Jay suggested that they use it as a reason to go away together for the night, his father agreed to let them go and have fun. Jay and Tanya had a simple, safe plan. Get the parts for Jay's dad's furnace, sleep in the van near the store, even though they had the money for a hotel, and come back the next day. They crossed the border from Canada into the United States as the sun was coming up. They were going on a road trip together, with nothing but the open road and each other. The trip from Victoria to Port Angeles on the MV Coho Ferry was smooth, and it arrived in Port Angeles around 4 p.m. About an hour later, the couple started driving southeast on Route 101 toward Bremerton. Somewhere along the way, Jay and Tanya missed the exit to the Hood Canal Bridge, which sent them on a longer route through the small town of Hoodsport around 8 p.m., where they stopped at Hoodsport Grocery to get some snacks. Inside, they met Judith Stone, a nice store clerk who was more than happy to help the young couple. Stone remarked that they had already gone well beyond the bridge. He then showed them another way to get to Seattle. They got to the town of Allen after an hour. As they kept going, they stopped again at Ben's Deli in Allen, Washington, where they were seen around 9.29 p.m. The store worker they talked to said they did not seem upset and were not with anyone else. At 10.16 p.m., Jay and Tanya got tickets for another boat to Seattle. Later, their car was seen on the ferry from Bremerton to Seattle, but they never made it to Jensko Heating. Instead, they met an end that no one could have expected. Tanya was always on time and took care of things, so when she did not call her mother the night they got back, alarm bells started going off. Tanya's mother tried to keep her calm, but she was worried and knew something was wrong. John, Tanya's older brother, was at college when he got a call from his worried father. The whole family was on edge as they tried to figure out what had happened to the couple. Jay's family was just as worried. They had planned for the young couple to come home on November 19, but they never did. They did not call, they did not leave notes, and they did not show up. By November 20, 1987, the families could no longer deal with not knowing what was going on. They knew something was very wrong and filed a report that their loved ones were missing. No one knew at the time that it would become one of the most puzzling and heartbreaking stories of a missing person in the Pacific Northwest's history. As the search for Jay and Tanya began, authorities were just starting to scratch the surface of the case. The cops had a hard job ahead of them because there was no sign of the couple and they had not heard from them. Sherry Ireton, who is in charge of media for the Snohomish County Sheriff's Department, led the search. She retraced the couple's steps to try to figure out what happened in the last moments of their trip. The detectives quickly realized that Jay and Tanya might have taken a wrong turn and gone south instead of east, and their last known sighting was when they bought ferry tickets. During the hour-long boat ride, they thought someone might have taken them. When they asked for directions, the agents did not believe simple answers like a trip to the hospital or a flat tire. They knew something terrible was going on. On November 24, 1987, a windy day, six days after Jay and Tanya went missing, a terrible thing was found. Someone picking up cans on the street saw something lying against a broken culvert. It looked like a storm was coming. As he got closer, the sight in front of him gave him the chills. It was Tanya's half-naked body under wet leaves in a ditch 20 yards off the rural Parson Creek Road near Algern's Gadget County, Washington. 
The location was a short distance south of Bellingham and about 80 miles north of Seattle. According to Chief Deputy Ron Panzero of the Skagit County Sheriff's Office, the state of her body made it clear that this was not an accident or a simple case of a missing person. Jennifer Sheehan Lee, an 18-year-old search and rescue volunteer, found the shell casing of a .380 caliber bullet half a mile west of Prairie Road. The officers also found plastic ties along the road that they thought were used to bind Hanya in the van. The killer had attacked and bound her before shooting her in the head at close range. The body was then rolled down the hill and mauled. As the investigation into Tanya's murder got more serious, the police started to look for Jay. The fact that he could not be found, and that the van was gone raised some questions. The detectives were leaving no stone unturned, and their attention turned to Jay as a possible suspect. Both Tanya's family and Jay's family were adamant that Jay could not have done such a terrible thing. As the investigation went on, the discovery of Chase Van 90 miles away in downtown Bellingham in Blue Diamond parking lot took the case to the next level. When they searched the area, they found a lot of things two blocks away from the van. Under the porch of Essie's, a local tavern, there were more plastic ties, Tanya's driver's license, the keys to the van, and a half-empty box of ammunition. Inside, they found zip ties and Tanya's black pants. The money order was still there, but no one had touched it. There was a bloody comforter, a used tampon on the floor, and a bunch of orange camel cigarette butts in the ashtray. Detective Robert Gabo of the Seattle Police Department thought that these clues were a direct taunt to make fun of the investigation. But some things were still missing, like Jay's black ski jacket. The idea that Jay, who seemed innocent and loved his girlfriend, killed her and left her to die, did not make sense to anyone, not even Tanya's family, who did not know what else could have happened to their beloved sweetie. As time went on, the initial suspicion of Jay turned into worry for his safety. The tension was high because every second counted in their race against the clock. On November 26, 1987, the day after Tanya's body was found, a pheasant hunter embarked on his hunting expedition, hoping for a successful day. As he walked beneath the towering high bridge over the Snoqualmie River on that chilly Thanksgiving morning, his excitement quickly turned to horror when his dog made a grim discovery. The lifeless body of a young man lay motionless on the ground, covered in a light blue blanket. It was Jay Cook, found in Snohomish County, approximately 70 miles away from where Tanya's body had been discovered just two days earlier. Jay had been brutally beaten and strangled with twine tied to two red dog collars. A tissue and a pack of camel cigarettes had been forced down his throat. Despite the numerous wounds on his body, he ultimately died from asphyxiation. Sergeant Robert Bart of Snohomish County Sheriff's Office noted that Jay's injuries indicated that he had endured significant suffering before his death, as it was not a swift process. To make matters more troubling, Jay's hands had been tied with plastic ties, a method commonly used by criminals with a history of prison time. Surprisingly, Jay's body was found near Monroe on a farm, prompting Snohomish County Detective Jim Scharf to suspect that the murderer was a seasoned predator, possibly even a serial killer. Even though the investigation had just started, it was clear that this was no ordinary crime. As the days went by, the seriousness of the situation became clearer. The story of the individual A killer was still out there, and there were few clues. The killer struck at four places, and the crime scenes were spread across three different counties, Snohomish, Skagit, and Whatcom, making it even harder to find leads. After days of searching the area where Jay was found, the police made a shocking discovery. They found a pair of bloody socks in the grass nearby. However, the killer had left something behind, a palm print on the back of the van that the detectives hoped belonged to the killer. Detective Robert Gabo was growing increasingly suspicious. He suggested that it was safe to assume that, by the time they disembarked from the ferry in downtown Seattle, Tanya and Jay were most likely in the company of the man responsible for their deaths. He believed that the killer had likely committed similar crimes in the past and had gotten away with them. 
indicating that this was not the predator's first killing. Moreover, he expressed his concern that the perpetrator might continue to commit such acts in the future. The cops were looking for any clue they could find, so they sent the black pants they found in the van to the medical examiner's office to be looked at. Hopefully, this will give them the answers they need. The forensics experts found something. There was body fluid on the pants, but it was not Jay's. The body fluid sample matched the DNA found in Tanya's body, so it was named Individual A. This was a big break in the case, and the detectives worked hard to compare the DNA profile of Individual A to that of all the suspects they had, but there was no match. They had to start all over again. It was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Plastic zip ties found near the bodies of the victims were the only thing that all of the crime scenes had in common. Detective Jim Scharf knew it was the killer's mark and part of his murder kit. Tanya's family was desperate for answers, so they offered a big prize of 50,000 Canadian dollars for any information that led to the capture of the killer. Despite their efforts, the trail went cold and the killer remained at large. The police were working hard and following every possible lead and idea. In December 1987, the families of Jay and Tanya were still sad about the deaths of their children when they got scary holiday cards. The Christmas cards sent to the families had taunting details about the killings, and the person who sent them said they were the killer. This made the families even more scared. The first two had postmarks from Seattle and dates of December 3, 1987. It was a sick and cruel game that Jay and Tanya's families had to play over and over again every month for a year, until the letters stopped coming. All of them had different postmarks from places like New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, and even Canada. Every month, they were ready for the taunting holiday cards that talked about the horrible deaths of their loved ones. But what made these cards really scary was that some of them were signed by Tanya and Jay, the people who were killed. The author went so far as to write letters to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and a newspaper in British Columbia. He seemed to enjoy causing trouble. Chief Deputy Ron Panzero emphasized the significance of apprehending the individual responsible, as this person's actions had been causing immense hardship for grieving parents who had lost their children. Even though the detective thought the writer might have been a homeless person traveling along the West Coast, the grammar and punctuation in the letters showed that he had gone to school in Canada. While the police continued to collect evidence and test for a DNA match in the lab, they called the person who wrote the letter and asked him where the lake was and where he had left his car during the killings. Detective Scharf expressed the desire to establish communication with the individual in question. There was a chance that the letter writer was the killer, but detectives thought he was probably just crazy. It was almost as scary as the deaths themselves to realize that someone out there thought this case was a joke. The families could only hope that the police would catch the real killer soon before any more sick people chose to make fun of their tragedy. In 1995, a new cold case team led by Detective Jim Scharf was eager to help families who had been waiting for decades. Among the pile of cases was the horrible murder of a young couple, Tanya Van Kallenborg and Jay Cook. Then, when it looked like they would never find the killer, Charles Sinclair's name showed up on the list. Charles Thurman Sinclair's reign of terror left a dark mark on the western part of the United States. The coin shop killer scared both people who sold coins and people who owned shops. Sinclair's crimes were not just those of a regular thief. They were the work of a serial killer who had gotten good at what he did in the 1980s and 1990s. Sinclair and his family moved around a lot, so he was a master of disguises. He was always on the move and changed his look to stay away from the police. Because of how complicated his crimes were, each state was looking into them as different events until a survivor gave a description of the killer that tied all of them together. Then, police officers from different states worked together to catch the coin shop killer. Sinclair was tied to 11 murders, one attempted murder, and two assaults. Detectives thought he might have been involved in the murders of Tanya and Jay. But on August 16, 1990, 
Sinclair was caught near his home in Kenny Lake, Alaska, after the survivor gave a description of the killer that tied the crimes together. Even though Sinclair did horrible things, it became clear that he was not the one who killed Tanya and Jay. Sinclair was different from other serial killers because he knew why he did what he did. He wanted money. Sinclair could not have known that the young couple going to a different country alone had enough money for them to be a target. Still, because he died of a heart attack on October 30, 1990, it is possible that we will never know the full amount of his crimes. The murder of a Canadian couple and the search for signs was a mystery for more than 20 years. In 2003, a forensic scientist from the Washington State Patrol named Lisa Collins joined the case. To find answers, she used modern technology. She chose to look at the evidence more closely, so she carefully looked at the profile of individual a made from the body fluid found at the crime scene. She sent it to CODIS, the FBI's National Offender Database. But no matches came up, despite her best efforts. It was a confusing situation that begged for answers. In May 2008, Snohomish County officials took a risky step to try to solve cold cases by giving a deck of cards to prisoners. They hoped to find some clues. One of the unanswered cases in the county was the sad story of Cook and Van Kylenborg, which was on the deck. Their scary cases were given to the King of Hearts, who used them to warn the other prisoners that justice still had to be done. Even though the DNA profile from the letters did not match the physical evidence from the crime scene, the author was still a suspect, and his DNA profile was put into a database of suspects. But there was a catch. The cops did not even want to charge the person who wrote the letter with a crime. All they wanted was for him to come forward and clear his name so they could find the real killer. They thought that after 23 years, he might feel bad or want to make things right, so they asked him to come forward and help them with their investigation. The search for the person who sent the mean letters took an unexpected turn when a Canadian who was watching the cold case show Washington's most wanted and saw the same handwriting on the envelopes called the police. The person who gave the tip did not give their name, but they did give the name of the suspect to the Snohomish police, who then gave it to the sheriff's office. The police had their work cut out for them, but they were glad to find the suspect's name in the case files thanks to a search of the database of names built by Skagit County detectives during the first investigation into the case. After the suspect suggested writing to true crime author Ann Rule, his name was added to the file. Rule was called by the police, and she told them about a possible suspect who had written to her and signed his name. The investigation took them to a homeless man who moved back and forth between Canada and Washington, making it hard to find him. After following several leads, the police found the man in western Washington, where he had recently been seen. Investigators set up a way to watch the man, and on August 20, 2010, they went up to him and talked to him. He said he was sorry and said he had tried to apologize to Jay's father before but lost his nerve. The man was in his seventies, had mental illness, and had been living on the streets for decades. Detectives found out that the man wrote the hurtful letters because he was upset about how Canadians had treated him and was having a hard time when he heard about the killings. He was already a big fan of writing letters, and for a year he kept sending letters and presents to the families. Even though the news gave the families of the dead some peace, they still did not know who the killer was. Due to the statute of limitations, the man who sent the letters could not be charged with stalking. When months turned into years, the never-ending hunt for good leads got old. The case file grew to include over 350 names, but no one seemed to fit the description of the predator they were looking for. But in 2018, Detective Jim Scharf heard about a new tool called Snapshot Phenotyping. This tool used a suspect's DNA to make a guess about his or her physical traits. With the help of Parabon Nano Labs, they got as much information as they could from individual A's bodily fluid samples and made a sketch of what the subject might look like at ages 25, 45, and 65. It was made public, but even though there were more than 70 possible leads, none of them seemed good 
and they still did not have a name. In 2018, when police made a shocking arrest in California, a new door opened for them. The detectives knew about another case that had stumped police for decades, a serial killer known as the Visalia Ransacker, the original Night Stalker, and the Diamond Knot Killer had been terrorizing California for years. He was violent in at least 15 different places, causing at least 50 injuries and 13 deaths. As the Golden State Killer, he was a scary figure that scared people in the state for more than 40 years. Investigators thought about the idea that Tanya and Jay were killed by the Golden State Killer, but the proof where the killer was and how he or she did it seemed to be different. Even though they tried hard, the Golden State Killer stayed out of reach until 2018, when a genetic database called GetMatch gave detectives a break. They finally found out that Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. was the Golden State Killer. Even though he was not a suspect in Jay and Tanya's case, his arrest was a success that led Detective Jim Scharft to use this new technology as well. Tanya's murder in 1987 had sent shockwaves through the town, and the investigation was in full swing. But while the cops worked hard to figure out what was going on, a story that seemed to have nothing to do with the mystery was happening in another part of town. Chelsea Rusted, who lives in Tumwater and is 31 years old, started looking into her family's history when she learned she did not know who her great-grandparents were. As she connected with distant relatives on social media, she found out that the Talbot brothers were second cousins she had never met before. She made friends with the sisters and kept in touch with them, but their brother was not on social media at all. Later, she added to her family tree and won a free DNA test kit from Ancestry DNA by entering a contest. Then she did something very important. She put her raw DNA on GetMatch, a website where people can share their DNA results in an open database. Chelsea spent about an hour on the site, hoping to find new cousins. She did not know that a new story was already starting in the police forensic department. In 2018, Parabon uploaded individual A's DNA to GetMatch as a brave step toward solving a sad case. They asked for help from Cease Moore, a famous expert in studying family trees on a TV show. The case of Jay and Tanya meant a lot to Cece because it happened when she was young, and it had a big effect on her. She felt a strong connection to it because Tanya was born in the same year as her, and she grew up in the same areas where the murders occurred. She was determined to do everything she could to solve this case and bring justice to the victims. Cece had a stressful night on April 27, 2018. She waited nervously, hoping that the database would show a match. She stayed up late and checked the database several times until the next morning, when she finally saw a list of two people who had enough DNA in common with individual A to be his second cousins. But things were not as simple as they looked. The cousins shared DNA with individual A but not with each other. This meant that they were linked to him through different branches of his family tree. Cece had to go back through the family tree and find the shared ancestor to find out who he was. Time was running out, and there was a lot of pressure, but Cece was determined to solve this case. As Cece looked into it more, she found a web of links that led to a shocking discovery. One of the cousins' names was different, which was lucky. In the two hours it took Cece to make the family tree, she found the name of the suspect. The cops went to the cousin with the unusual name and knocked on his door. As the cops stood outside the house, they knew that the person behind the door held the key to a case that had been unsolved for decades. When the person opened the door, the officers knew they were at the right location. It was Chelsea Rusted's home, and the suspect was Chelsea's second cousin, who did not have a social media account. William Earl Talbot Aya was born to Patricia Peters and William Earl Talbot Sr. in 1969. As a child, he was troubled, and as he grew up, he became angry and violent. He went by the name Bill. From a young age, he had trouble controlling his anger, which made it hard for his family to deal with him. Molina Grail, Talbot's younger sister, talked to Detective Eric Fagan from the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office about some of the scary things that happened to her with her brother. 
Grail told the story of how Talbot kicked her while he was wearing boots, and she had to call the cops on him. She also said he thought he deserved something in life. He has not talked to his family in almost twenty years. Grail talked about a time when Talbot and their crippled father pushed each other when Talbot was only eleven years old. Even though he and his sisters went to therapy, it did not seem to help. The longer Talbot lived, the worse things got. When he was sixteen, he told his father that as soon as he got his license, he was going to run him over with a car. His other sister, Inga Ruth, also went through hard times because of Talbot. Ruth told the cops that Talbot hurt her when she was about eleven years old. Talbot also hurt her badly when she was fifteen years old. He broke her tailbone and gave her other major injuries. Ruth turned down the sound on the radio in her bedroom, but Talbot wanted it turned all the way up. He broke down the door to open it, hurting her in the process. Her folks had to take her to the hospital. Inga also said that Talbot had dropped the family cat, Nikki, down a well. Her father had to get the cat out and clean the well. Talbot's violent acts kept him from his family for almost twenty years. He did not talk to them, pick up the phone when they called, or answer their texts. Talbot came back to invite her to her second wedding, her son's wedding, and her daughter's graduation. Grail told her. He even skipped the funeral for his mother. William Talbot I did a lot of different things. He drove a short-haul truck for a Seattle company during the day, and at night he liked to ride bikes and hang out with his friends. He lived in a nice house just north of Seattle Airport. Other than a few minor arrests, his record was clean. But when he was charged with two counts of aggravated first-degree murder in the brutal killings of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kylenborg, his life was turned upside down. As police looked into Talbot's past, they found that he had been in trouble with the law before. Even though he had never been convicted of a crime before, in 1984 he was charged with misdemeanor assault in King County. Even though he admitted guilt, his sentence was put off as long as he went to anger management or batterer's therapy. Even so, he got more orders for missing court dates and not paying fines, which made his otherwise unremarkable past look bad. The cops had finally found him. Here was a man who had never been suspected of anything, who had never done anything wrong, and yet all the evidence seemed to point straight to him. William Earl Talbot I had been able to stay out of trouble and hide in plain sight for many years. As a truck driver, he seemed to live a normal life. He did not have much of an online presence, and he put on a carefully made normal face. But as soon as the agents started to look into it, everything was about to fall apart. They found out that Talbot had grown up just seven miles from where Cook's body had been found. That was important information because the DNA evidence from the crime scene pointed to someone with a strong link to the area. As the investigation into the brutal killings of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kellenborg went on, police knew they needed hard evidence to link William Talbot to the crimes. Detective Jim Scharf and his team went to great lengths to keep an eye on Talbot because they had to gather DNA proof. Officers in plain clothes followed him everywhere he went, trying to get a break. As the days turned into weeks, the stress grew. But in May 2018, on a lucky day, they finally got their big break. Talbot had stopped at a coffee shop, and as he drove away, a paper cup fell out of his truck. Two miles south of the downtown Seattle ferry port, he stopped at a traffic light on West Marginal Way at Spokane Street. He opened the door to the semi-truck and stepped out onto the running board, and a paper cup fell out of the truck. Even though it was a small piece of proof, it was enough to turn the case around. The state crime lab quickly tested the cup and proved what the detectives had thought all along. Talbot's DNA matched the bodily fluids found on the victims. William Talbot Aya was charged with kidnapping, assault, double murder, and robbery after DNA evidence from a cup matched DNA found at the crime scenes. The trial was tense, with the defense arguing against the strength of the DNA evidence. The jury eventually found Talbot guilty of two counts of first-degree murder, and he received a life sentence without parole. However, after a juror's bias came to light, the conviction was temporarily thrown out 
but later reinstated by the appeals court. Talbot's second cousin, Rusted, felt relief and closure as justice was served, and the families of the victims found solace after a long and painful journey. The memory of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Killenborg would forever live on in the hearts of their loved ones and the community. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for future updates. Thanks for watching.